very beautiful Medinilla in the Melas Tomatase. It's a low epiphyte. It has, we see, it has quite huge leaves with the vines very prominent on the lower surface of the leaves. At the top also are accumulating, of course, some leaves from the canopy. And we see actually that they are decaying and probably the Medinilla can absorb some nutrients through the small hairs here. So we see the decaying leaves in the axil of the leaves and some emergent structure which are like hairs, maybe roots, maybe simply hairs, but anyway, probably it can absorb humidity and nutrients accumulated here along these uh, bases of the leaves of this uh, Medinilla. And we see the vines, uh, so prominent vines on the lower surface of the leaf and of course the so beautiful bright orange fruits. These are perfect fruits for the small birds of the forest industry. It seems actually that they become black if they have been not eaten at the orange red stage. They can be eaten at the black stage by some other birds. And here also we see the roots. Yes, it seems it's really some roots growing along the stem. The tallest moss of the world is the genus Dawsonia, and we see here they are about 20 centimeters tall around. And actually, these Dawsonia are always erect like this and growing only, of course, in very humid places because they need humidity at night, especially to uptake the water. And uh, these Dawsonia are characteristic of many forests of Asia and a lot also in the Pacific Islands. Even in New Zealand, for instance, there are big patches of Dawsonia in the forest. So it can be both tropical, but tropics, it's mostly in mountain and in southern temperate forest. Not only the plant is huge, but we see also that the capsule, terminal capsule at the top of the stem, is also a huge compared to most of the other mosses we can see in the world. This fern, which is probably a stickerus, it's uh, the same group as the Decranolepis, and we see it has a very long growth, continuous, and we see it can divide into two equal parts. And again, here we see at the apex, it has a new prolongement of the growth, and it will be producing again part of the fronds laterally displayed like this. Here we see, for instance, this one has the beautiful black central rashes and we see it is growing from each part again, again, and finally it becomes a kind of a climber. Another species of the same group of the Dicranopteris glycania ferns with the beautifully divided fronts and continuing to grow at the apex. But what is very special in this one actually are these filaments just at the junction 
between the two fronts, the two parts of the front. Oh yes, it's uh, actually it's like a tiny front, tiny, totally bifurcated front, and probably due to a situation of the erect shape, probably they can absorb humidity during the night or during the rain, and probably it's a way to have the best captation of humidity. Yes, here we see clearly these are small specialized fronds. Due to the shape once it's totally developed, that these are kind of tiny parts of fronds, so probably absorbing water and some minerals during the night. This Schefflera is epiphytic, which is quite usual in the Schefflera species, but what is not at all usual is the length of the internodes between the leaves. We see it's a Schefflera because leaves have three leaflets, but internodes are 10 or more centimeters long. But what is strange, I see an element growing Oh yes, I see the detail. It is a ligule, because the Schefflera, uh, the base of the leaf is embracing the stem, and here, just above at the base of the petiole, is a ligular part of the sheath, and actually this ligular part is totally erect and enclosing. What, ooh, it's so strange. This kind of a structure empty in the middle and totally wrapped on itself could be a good place for ants. Tu crois que ça fait tout à fait poche à fourmi ce truc là C'est très bien. Je dois dire une fourmi qui marche là. Quelle structure étrange. C'est étrange hein, ce truc qui, qui. On voit bien qu'il part de la base de la feuille qui est engainante et ça qui émerge. This uh, small shrub is a psychotria, or an allied genus, and it has perfectly celadon blue fruits, small berries, ideal for small birds of the forest understory. Anonace. Family, probably a goniothalamus. It has the flowers arising directly from the stem. It's a coliflory. We can see the leaves, which are nothing special, but the pleasure tropic stem is typical of Anonaceae. And we see the so beautiful hanging flowers. And we see it's Anonaceae family because at the base we see the three sepals, which are totally bright pink, reddish sepals, and then the base of the petals, which is green, and the lobes also bright pink. So, pink for the <laughs> peduncle, red for the sepals, green for the base, and pink for the beautiful hanging petals. On the inside, we see the three inner petals inside the flower. These are the juvenile leaves, the juvenile fronds of a climbing fern and are called batifils because usually they are fixed to the trunk. And what is incredible is to see how much they are laciniated 
totally dissected. And after, when we don't see the idle stage, but they become much more entire. If I remember, it's a Lincea. I don't remember the species, but it should be a Lincea. So it's a genus of ferns, usually not climbing. Another species of Ardisia, and uh, this one is uh, more characteristic of what is usual. I mean that the insertion of the lateral branches on the main stem is totally like a vertical oval, and this is a very good way to recognize an Ardisia and some other Myrcinaceae also. in the forest at uh, 1,600 meters above sea level uh, in Mount Kinabalu. It's surprising because we see very few begonias and uh, here we see one of them with an erect stem and hanging flower. I think maybe it's a begonia berylae, but it's surprising that uh, we don't see everywhere begonias. Oh, ben, je pense que c'est une ananasée. Peut-être que c'est... C'est le chéri, je pense, en fruit. C'est le rose. En oh. fruit, je pense. Le pédonculé rose. Les feuilles, regarde, c'est exactement les mêmes feuilles. Donc c'est le fruit de la fleur rose qu'on a vu tout à l'heure, qui était sur ouais. le... Uh, here is a fern we know quite well. The name before was Oleandra pistillaris, but I think it did change. Actually, it's a very lignified fern. It has groups of a few blades, like this, few fronts, and then growing again in the middle, and it can reach two or three or even five meters tall in some cases. It's a quite primitive group of fern. It's characteristic of most mountains in East Asia. A piper, a shrubby piper, and the inflorescence at just opposite to each leaf, characteristic of most piper. This one also is beautiful because the leaves are very velvety. Here we see the same Lincea fern climbing, and here the adult stage with the fronds which are much less dissected. So and they are totally detached from the support. Yeah, we see clearly the story at the edge of each element of each pinnule of the frond. The structure typical of the Lincea ferns.
this Colocasia, which uh, looks a little bit simple, but actually we see that the leaf is very shiny, which is not so usual for the Colocasia, as opposite to the Alocasia. So this Colocasia, actually, if I correctly remember, is a very rare species, maybe endemic from this lower part of Mount Kinabalu, and if I remember, it could be something like Colocasia oresbia, a name quite similar. Here, just under a quite uh, inconspicuous shrub, <laughs> it has few branches, it has green leaves, it has small black fruit, but actually it's uh, interesting because uh, it's an Ardisia, and the genus Ardisia in the Myrcinaceae or Primulaceae, it's, uh, it's the same, uh, is a very important uh, group of uh, shrubs in the forest understory. Some are very small and carpeting, Many are about one or two meters high, and very few are trees. Why? I see it's an Aradisia. First, the fruits at the terminal part of the stem have with groups like this and hugging down are quite characteristic, but most characteristic actually is the insertion of the lateral small branches with a huge swollen base, this is, typical of the Myrcinaceae and especially of the genus Aradisia. We see that the stems are always by groups of five, six, separate by long parts without stems and stems again. And finally, we see in the younger parts, so of course they are totally covered by fruits, again, these groups growing at the top. So it means that Less than every year, there is a group of stems. So this is a small thing, but probably a very, very old small thing. Another Medinilla with uh, <laughs> these uh, bunches of uh, fruits. And uh, this one, it seems that actually the inflorescence are axillary and not terminal because, for instance, here we see two opposite leaves and here we see two bunches of hanging fruits in the axil of the leaves. It is also, in some cases, coliflorous because we see inflorescence appear where there are no more leaves. All along the rocky banks of this fast-flowing small forest stream, we see actually these aroids, these aracées, it's a Piptospata or the Piptospata alliance, and growing really typically as a rheophytic plant with quite long leaves and totally fixed to the rocks. And we see actually that the seeds are very small because we see all the tiny individuals germinating directly on the rocks among the mosses covering the rocks. So we have absolutely all the stages, which means that the regeneration is perfect.
a zingiber. So one of these understory species of zingiber with the inflorescence typically arising at the base of the clump of leafy stems. This species has quite wide leaves. This is a Cyperaceae, so the sedge family, and it's uh, very strange because this one is a totally understory species, it's a Mapania, and the inflorescence arising on this stem bearing only one leaf. But what is so special in this forest understory Cyperaceae is that the blades are very, very wide and they have a peciolate. <laughs> lower part, so they don't look at all like uh, the usual sedges we can see in most temperate countries. So it's a very, very beautiful mapania. Beautiful individual of the Begonia berylae, a species we can find in the mountains at the Mount Kinabalu, and very velvety leaves on the dark purple vines. And we see a female flower with a three winged ovary. And oh, yes, here I see a baby with a very beautifully white, maculated leaves and also all the points <laughs> of the leaves also are totally bright white uh, color it's a silvery color so it's a reflective effect but we see it's uh, still very velvety and on these patches of course means for the animals that the leaf is already partly eaten so probably it's a protection against herbivorous animals A very strange plant, uh, but actually when I see the inflorescence, I see it's a pilea, it's a member of Urticaceae, and opposite leaves and the shape of inflorescence means a pilea, but I've never seen this. The stem is totally winged, four winged, and it's a huge plant. I've never seen this kind of pilea. Philagatis elliptica, a quite common species here on the Mount Kinabalu. And uh, we see the leaves, the surface is uh, a little bit dark green, and the lower surface is uh, quite bright pink. We see, of course, the vines, the very prominent vines on the lower surface of the leaf. And here, another individual which is totally bright dark purple under the leaf surface and the upper side of the leaf is much more dark brown than the other one and there are some other forms which are actually totally green on both sides of the leaves upper and lower side we see the small capsular foot which are contrary to sonerilla which are three shaped and uh, there are three divisions this philagatis is a characteristic of the genus as four it's a square division at the top but otherwise it's the same cup splash capsular fruit which allow dispersal of the seeds through raindrops c'est beau le fait que ça irrégulier les bords 
Voilà, ben on connaît bien ça. Oui, c'est ce qui se met à glottis. À des spécies, c'est sur les widespread, comme South Thailand, Malaysia, Borneo, New Guinea, en Moluccas. So it's uh, one of the very few species with the so large distribution. On this fallen trunk, totally covered by mosses, we see actually very beautiful specimen of Philagatis elliptica, perfectly adult with all the small fruits in the axils of the leaves. I think it's axillary. We see also the stem which is very hairy. And it is perfectly growing. It uh, germinates among the mosses because the seeds are so small they can germinate only on inclined support like this. When it's growing on the soil, it's because it's a leaf cutting giving new individuals and not the seeds which are too small to allow germination among the dead leaves. This uh, climbing stem belongs to, the, to a species of Poikilospermum. And Poikilospermum is a member of Urticaceae, but it's a very, very woody uh, Urticaceae. So the stem does not become huge, but what is very interesting, we see that when it is climbing, we see all the lateral roots totally embracing the trunk support, the support trunk. And once it arrives at about five or seven meters, suddenly it spreads its branches in all the directions and it creates an undercrown to the main crown tree. And we see the zigzagging snake-like stems of this uh, Poikilospermum. And we see here a big, a big branch and smaller branches and always these embracing woods a little bit like a closure. Yeah. Tiny Argostema gracile, which is really moss like, covering totally the mosses. It has many small erect capsular fruit. So this so small Argostema is spreading a little bit like an erect moss or an erect selaginella in this very humid places. At the extremity of the stem, we see the campanulate white flower. And what is very interesting is that this flower is totally hanging down like a bell. And it's not at all usual in the genus Argostema. Usually flowers are erect. And this one is totally bending down. And what is quite funny is that the capsule, once it is ripe, is totally erect. Why it is erect? It's for the rain splash effect of the small, tiny seeds, which can thus explode and germinate on the mosses around. So the Argostema gracile is here, and what is very funny is that just above, here, we see something very similar, also totally plagiotropic in growth, with pseudo-alternate leaves. I mean, one leaf is big, and the opposite one is a small green leaf, and we see exactly the same erect capsular foot. But there is a difference in that in this sonerilla, actually we see the small flower bud or pink emerging here. The flower is also erect, while in the Argostema it is downward oriented. So exactly 
the same habit, the same way of reproductive pattern, and the same habitat, and the families are totally different. The Argostema is Rubiaceae, member of the coffee family, while the Sonerilla, same as all the Medinilla we have seen, is a member of the Melastomataceae. These two families, Melastomataceae and Rubiaceae, are not at all related. So this means clearly that the habitat allows the same direction of evolution towards the same adaptation to a given habitat. This uh, big shrubby Medinilla is uh, very abundant around the headquarters of the Kinabalu National Park at uh, about uh, 1,600 meters above sea level in the fresh air, of course. And uh, this Medinilla is Medinilla speciosa. Actually, we can find it also in, uh, in the Malay Peninsula in different areas. It is quite common in different places. And we see it's uh, flowering all the year round and for instance among these branches we see here a small inflorescence only at the stage of flower bud this one which is totally ready to open the flowers many flowers are already open with a so beautiful dark purple stamens here some older inflorescence and here the fruits are developing and we see actually that when it's young the axes are pale pink and when the fruits are maturing the axes of the inflorescence become dark red purple red same as the fruit so we can see here much more mature infructescence and the birds love to eat all the berries and when they are not eaten at this stage, they are eaten when they become black. So this Medinilla speciosa is very common here and we understand why people love it so much. All the year round, you have all the stages. This much branched shrubby species of ficus is growing mostly at the forest edges but in quite low lighted places and it's like many plants with plagiotropic stems, any families it can be, the leaves are totally asymmetric and we see these so beautifully shaped hanging leaves with the upper part of the half leaf which is much bigger than the lower part in the direction of the lower area. So here we see it's a ficus due for instance to the extremity of the stem totally protected by the stipules and when we look closely at the leaf venation many many small square things which are typical of ficus. These are huge lianas actually are the stem of uh, 
boinia, one of the many species of climbing boinia. Sometimes then we see a small shoot arising from the big old stems. We see the leaves are typical leaves of boinia, butterfly shaped. We see, for instance, one yellow leaf which has really the, the both wings of the typical boinia leaves. So this uh, shrub with these so strange orange things emerging at the top is actually Schefflera. It is Schefflera bipalmatifolia. It's a species quite common in the Mount Kinabalu at uh, this altitude, uh, more around 1,500 meters. It grows at the edges of the forest and bipalmatifolia is because is a uh, palmate leaf but actually it's not a leaf it's one part of the leaf and it is also at this part again we have the first explosion of one two three four five elements which again divide into five more elements which are the leaflets so B palmatifolia is because it's palmate two times one time according to the Special emerging from the stem on the second time. Here is a very strange structure. It's at the end of the petiole, and the, all the bases of this secondary part of the leaf are totally, totally inflated like a geniculum. And each part looks like a many anthurium species. Of course, this could be totally an anthurium, even when we look at the swollen part just under the leaflet, it's exactly like the geniculum of many anthurium. And it's funny because this Schefflera is of the family Araliaceae, so it looks like anthurium, which is family Araceae. So the names are quite similar. The shapes of the leaves are quite similar, but totally different. The Araceae are monocots, and monocotyledons, while Schefflera is a member of Araliaceae, which is a family close to the carrot. <laughs> so it's, uh, some, uh, there are some uh, herbaceous members, some shrubby and some tree members, so totally different. And also, same as for Araceae, the base of the leaf is sheathing, so it means it's, uh, the sheath is turning around on the stem of the plant. So, this is mostly a characteristic of monocotyledons, but of course some decots also have the sheathing leaf base, but it's not so common at all in decots. So it's very interesting to see that these decots are not much branched, only one stem in this most of the Araliaceae, and it is a leaf which is totally branched, like a lateral branch of the stem, but actually this is a totally compound leaf. So, no ramification in the stem, huge ramification in the leaves. Exactly same as the anterior in Araceae again. And at the top, it is, of course, the inflorescence. We on these are the berries. Now it's a berry stage. And we see all the stages from light yellow to orange, dark orange, brown, reddish, red, brownish, and finally black. So. Probably the seeds are ripe at all the stages and according to different birds, some birds will prefer the yellow stage while others the orange stage or the dark red or the black stage. But in all cases, the seeds are inside the pulp of uh, these berries. It's tiny seeds which are somewhat sticky. It's why they germinate very often as epiphytes uh, or on slopes, on rocks, mossy rocks on the slopes in quite lighted areas, but this one we can find it in totally shaded forest under storage. Quite uh, ubiquitous about the, what they need for the life. So, 
inflorescence is branched on terminal and after it will be another stem arising from above. This tiny orchid is totally carpeting the old trunk in the same way as a moss and also the leaves, the disticus leaves, are totally oppressed to the support so it retains the humidity in the same way as the mosses and we see the flowers terminating the small stems, many small flowers and the stems hanging down. One of the small species of Sonerilla, a little bit blue iridescent color, and we see the erect capsular fruits in the three parts typical of the Sonerilla in the Melastomataceae. One of the Jewel orchids is the Anectochilis group, of course, but there are many different genera and totally cryptic in the forest understory due to the brown leaves and the bright silvery, golden, uh, we don't know exactly, vines. The vines are totally unlighted. It's due to the epidermal cells which are empty and are filled with air and not filled with water or sap. So it's why they are very shiny like this. Yes, this fern actually has a bluish front. They are very young plants when the fronts are close to the ground and after fronts become bigger and bigger and the design of the lateral vines is absolutely incredibly beautiful. And here we see, for instance, the young fronts which are bluish, so it means blue iridescent when they are close to the ground and after they become much more green. Very beautiful design of the structural three-dimensional design of the vines is so perfect. The design of the front is so strange it seems to be totally inverted and when we move a little bit we see actually that the surface of the front is incredibly velvety and reflecting the light in different directions. Of course this is due to all 
the epidermal cells which are totally dome shaped it uh, reflects uh, a light which is bluish here we see the adult stage of this so beautiful fern when it's uh, juvenile with the vines so perfectly designed on the bluish color and here in the adult stage it's not so exciting visually but actually it's, uh, it becomes uh, divided front and just under we can see the sorry linear sorries if I remember it's uh, probably a diplasium I have to check later and we see uh, all the sorry brown sorry along the vines on the lower surface of the front which is usual in the ferns but here also the design is very beautiful very elegant We can see the natural habitat of the Medinilla speciosa. It is growing on a boulder inside a forest stream. So it, is, it receives a little bit more light because compared to the surrounding understory due to the light opening of the canopy, but sometimes it can grow as an epiphy, but mostly it is a saxicolos, so a rock dwelling species. small cyperacee with totally wavy undulate leaves very similar to Crinum natans from West Africa or Calamistratum, Crinum calamistratum but it's a cyperacee I don't know which genus of course maybe related to Carex and we see here the terminal inflorescence so the structure of the inflorescence with small lateral spikes. When I see the basal flowers with uh, something prominent which could be stigmatic clubs and the apical brown part, it really looks like uh, many carex inflorescence with the female flowers in the lower part and the terminal part of the spike which is with the male flowers and which is brown so it seems it's a really a member of a cyperaceae I say that due to the lower flowers with expanded structure which is probably a stigmatic surface and on each lateral spike or terminal spike we see a brownish kind of a very narrow cylinder and it's probably the male flowers and it looks really like the structure of a carex or other related genera of cyperaceae or the sedges. When we see these uh, tiny tufted things uh, covering the vertical surface of this uh, mossy rock, we don't know if it's a quite big moss uh, or a tiny orchid or maybe a fern. Why not a tiny Argostema species, still smaller than the Gracile, so or uh, Selaginella? So, actually, to see what it is. No, no flowers arising from nowhere. And uh, oh, on the under surface, uh, I see it's a fern. I see the sorry hidden in the kind of crypt. It's uh, each lateral part of the front which is recurved uh, like a spoon. So it's uh, probably a fern of the Gramitid Alliance. It's mostly small ferns, not always small like this. <laughs> this is this 
absolutely incredibly tiny living thing among the mosses and also liverworts, a small selaginella, and the climbing Fresinesia here. Many people are living here close to this granitic fur. I'm very surprised to see on the top of the slope close to the river this plant because it is obviously an Ophiopogon and I'm surprised because Ophiopogon is mostly a genus from China and the Japan southwards to Peninsular Malaysia and also of course in the Vietnam and Cambodia but more south like here in Borneo Actually, it is probably the maximum of the limit, considering the latitude, of the genus Ophiopogon. Because it's mostly a warm, temperate genus, or in tropics in mountains. So here in Mount Kinabalu, here at 1,500 meters, it is growing in the same way as we can see in some mountains of southern China, for instance. It is very beautiful. It has a stem with some still truths fixing it in the soil so very harmonious shape of this of your pogon this uh, tree is quite common here it's a member of the Myrtaceae and it is a genus Tristaniopsis, so it's close to Tristania. And here it's so easy to spot with this so beautiful peeling orange-red bark. All of these ropes uh, hanging vertically from this small trunk actually are uh, largely from shoots bearing the fruit, the fruit of what? Of a ficus. So we see all these branches going to the ground and actually we can see all the small fix, fixed laterally on the branches because ramification is very dense and we see the small greenish fix. So I know some ficus with this habit but this one is strange because also we see some roots produced along this flageliform flowering shoot. It's not so usual.
the typical habitat of many begonia on the vertical surface of a big boulder. So it's one of the so many species we can see in Borneo. And here is an individual with male flowers with a stamen in the center and just a few centimeters away a inflorescence with the developing female fruit. So I don't know if this one is dioecious species meaning some individual males and individual females or if different stage of development of the inflorescence which can be first the male flowers and secondary the female flowers. You can see the young stage here and still younger the first leaves developing on the vertical rock. So this is due to the small dust seeds dispersed by the wind or by rain splash. The potos of the section Allopotos which has something quite characteristic. First, the leaves are very asymmetric and one narrow edge and large edge opposite and the vines are dark green while the global surface of the blade is yellowish green so it's not so common display of a color and we can see this on most individuals. The bat cave with the characteristic smell of the bats probably covering the top surface of the rocks surrounded by ferns and begonias. This is a big species of Anthrophium and due to the thick leaves, thick fronds, which uh, are succulent and which retain water, it can withstand quite long dry periods. Of course, it's a little bit dehydrated, so the fronds are a little bit reclining, but they survive perfectly in this environment, which is a little bit difficult because there is no soil at all, no mosses, almost nothing. And we can see the brown roots of the Anthrophium totally covering these rocks. Anthrophium roots growing at the surface of the rock and close to the plant, totally carpeting the rock and retaining the water due to the ramification of the woods. This is a big-leaved Alocasia species, but usually this group of Alocasia with very triangular leaves on the very long posterior lobes of the leaves usually are much smaller species because it's the group of Alocasia macrorhizos which has huge wide leaves but this one, this group of Alocasia has much narrower leaves, very long petioles and usually they have only very few leaves at a time but here this one has a four leaves perfectly healthy so it's a not, uh, not so usual. It is one of the many species of Alocasia we can see, of course, in Borneo. This uh, shrub has perfectly distributed leaves in successive discs separated by long part of stem without any leaf. So it's a very good solution to absorb the lateral light arriving at different levels and of course this level being quite high allows the light to penetrate till the center of this disc of leaves. So these are discs of leaves about 10 leaves and to know if it's a shrub or a tree is not so simple. Oh, you, oh la la. yes, when I look at the lower side of the leaf with this color, bluish color, is characteristic of Loracea 
family, the avocado family. So probably this is the young stage of a big tree in the Loracée. So the young stage is perfectly adapted to the shade of the forest understory, but once it becomes a big tree, it loses this distribution and the leaves probably are much smaller and more unevenly distributed than in this case, because sometimes the trees also are able to adopt some strategies to catch the low light level of the forest in the same way as some shrubby species. This shrub, actually, when I see the hanging inflorescence, is a member of the Urticaceae, and it is the genus Dendrocnidae. And uh, usually, Dendrocnidae are, have very, very dense stinging hairs and very powerful stinging. I thought, but it seems, it seems it has no stinging hairs. It seems so. But uh, we see the structure of the inflorescence, probably a male inflorescence with a purple peduncle and the flowers not yet fully open. It has a main stem and the lateral stems bearing the flowers. And we see that for the architectural design, it's perfect because the main stem has quite huge leaves and the lateral stems have new leaves only when they escape the central part of the main stem with the long leaves. We see here, for instance, this lateral stem has no leaves at all, a small one, and then once it is out of the central crown of the leaves, it produces the new leaves. Same here, once escape the big leaves of the central stem, it produces the leaves. So again, a perfect architecture to catch the low light level of the forest and their story. This uh, Raphidophora climbing is strange because it has huge upraised shingle leaves. Many species have upraised leaves like this, but this one has really huge velvety leaves. And what is also surprising, when the stem becomes detached, it retains these leaves which are very wide and totally juvenile type. So, I hope later I can see the adult stage because some species can be somewhat neotenic. I mean, in some cases, the inflorescence can appear on these stems which retain the juvenile leaves because usually all the group of Raphidophora cortasi have juvenile leaves like this, but usually no bigger than this. But when they become adult, of course, they have totally dissected leaves. So I should like to see, but first time I see so huge shingle leaf. Here we see a, a patch of a beautiful Sirtandra which has dark green leaves and silvery white patches on the surface of the leaves. And what is very special is the inflorescences along the stem. These inflorescences have huge opposite bracts, totally campanulate with indentate margin. Of course, the flowers arise in the middle, probably old 
inflorescences because yes nothing inside and even probably all the fruit have been developed but what is very interesting is to see that the bracts are really creating a cup around the flowers and probably in some way retaining some water during maturation of the berry fruits. On this beautiful individual we can see the bracts and the flowers, the yellow flowers emerging from the bracts. At this stage the bracts which are cup shaped are still quite small and the flowers have the tube inside the bract and only the lobes of the corolla are expanding out of the bracts. Here we see in this one we see the accumulation of water in the center of the cup shaped bracts and we see the maturing green fruit inside the water so the flowers emerge above and finally the bracts are developing and creating a much more deep cup of water allowing maturation of the fruits. And just above this beautiful leaved Sirtandra what we see an arizema which has the two leaves and also the inflorescence and this species is quite characteristic it has the green upper part of the spot and the totally yellowish white limit to the tube so we have the white tube with the inflorescence with the spadix inside because it's an aroid and then the opening is protected by the upper recurve part of the spot and we see this very beautiful and strange design line on the top of the tube. Another member of the Gesneriaceae but this one is flowering very close to the ground. Probably it's also another species of Sirtandra because otherwise it seems climbing a little bit or erect. It's a small plant actually, I see the stems around. It's a quite small shrubby plant. I'm surprised to see so big flowers at this size and uh, the perfectly tubular flowers are really Sirtandra like because there are also other genera and of course the, in the Didymocarpoid alliance like a Codonobea but uh, impossible to be sure about what this creature is. Actually just above I see that this is the foliage and I really think it's a Sirtandra when I see the shape of the leaves but it's uh, so strange to see a very small species like this with so huge flowers. Here we see many ficus with all the roots embracing and killing the tree because we see the host tree which is totally dead in the center, only the trunk is remaining but the ficus is very healthy. But anyway, it is a good support for this Arase because just before I did think it was a form of Raphidophora close to Raphidophora cortalsi, but now when I look I see the white spots on the leaves so it seems maybe it's simply a huge form of a Syndapsus pectus. And what is interesting is that we see that the white spots actually are exactly the places where the blade was destroyed on the bigger plants before. So maybe because these white spots actually are places where the whole the cells of the epidermal cells are dome-shaped and empty filled with gas. 
So probably they have a very strong power of concentrating the light. So simply, if a big branch did fall, suddenly much more light reaching the plant did burn these places, these spots, which were totally silvery white. And increasing the light intensity is good in the, of course, in the forest understory, but as soon as there is a small branch or big branch falling around, increase of light can kill all the cells below these blotches. This uh, Kirkeligo actually is a big species and it's uh, quite strange because it has really parabolic leaves which are widest at the first third and this global shape, toric shape, allows accumulation of the dead leaves in the middle creating litter. Usually the Kirkeligo are not so well distributed for the leaves Usually leaves are much more erect and falling a little bit in all directions. First time I see a curculigo like this one. It's une forêt très dominée par les ficus. Ah, et puis il y a des oui, fraissinessiens en haut. Oh, sorry. No. Oh, sorry. It's a fern. It's a fern, yes. It's a probably a diplasium. Because then we see the young stage with entire fronds. Uh, it seems it's uh, probably a diplasium and maybe not far from the beautiful diplasium cordifolium that we have seen at the Mount Kinabalu and uh, the very beautiful design also of uh, the parallel vines and regularly transverse perpendicular tertiary vines. This uh, huge ginger is uh, what we call in France uh, the rose de porcelain. It's a uh, Etlingera elatio, it changed many times uh, of the genus. So maybe it is totally natural or it could be a bird bringing a seed in this clearing of the forest, a big forest gap here. So it's a perfect place for huge ginger like this. Anyway, the structure of the inflorescence is so beautiful and we see that it produces fruit so it is uh, totally fertile producing the fruit so maybe it's why it's uh, native here this uh, costus is a branched species so of course the leaves are spirally arranged but it has lateral stems and we see everywhere these lateral stems. But actually what is very beautiful is the inflorescence arising from the base of the cane stems. And this individual has a very beautiful light orange color of the labellum. Clearly it's a close to gingers. It's a separate family, costaceae, but it's very close to gingiberaceae. And uh, sometimes we see ant nests in uh, these uh, structures, but uh, no, no ant nests here. So before there were only two species, considered two species of costus in Asia, in this area, but now it has been split into quite many species. So this one, I don't know which one it is.
L'alternance est belle. Hein. Il y a du gris, il y a du blanc, il y a du vert, il y a le marron de la gaine. C'est très très beau. This is small shrubby species with square stems. Uh, really looks uh, family labiate. Square stems, opposite leaves, uh, the shape of the fruit, uh, the white and large calyx uh, is a quite a good evocation of a quite mini chlorodendron, but otherwise another labiate. Not so common at all to have this so strong contrast between white peripheral structure, the calyx here, and the black inner part, which are the small berries. A jewel orchid of the Anectochilus group, totally cryptic among the dead leaves. It can survive because it is growing on slopes among the mosses, but actually it's uh, totally invisible among the dead leaves. Oh, it's not a fruit, it's an insect. Oui, c'est une protection. Oh, tu te souviens, c'est ici. Ah, je sais ce animal, je ne me souviens pas de ce qu'il est. Si c'est un crustacéen, ou un insecte, ou un millipède, je ne me souviens pas, mais la protection est très, très efficace, totalement curve en soi, totalement comme like une armure. Tu vois, tu reconnais la tige mêlée. Cette yeah. pilea. Is growing on uh, this vertical cliff and the stem is totally winged. It is very efficient because this succulent stem keeps the water during the dry periods and when we see that it's growing on vertical cliff, of course the rock is directly exposed so of course it's good to keep the water during the dry period. We see it flowering the typical axillary inflorescences of the Pilea. Yes, on this uh, seeping rock, we see the water flowing under mossy rock. We see this very beautiful erect elatostema with uh, totally bullate leaves. The color is very light green, which is not so common in elatostema because usually they have a high concentration of chlorophyll, but this one has not too much, but maybe because it's growing on a seeping rock quite exposed to the light. So we see this uh, poikilospermum with the uh, huge leaves uh, climbing along the trunk and the inflorescence, uh, typically the shape of urticaceae nettle family inflorescence, but here in the case of this poikilospermum it's a huge, uh, totally cupola shaped uh, it's uh, probably the male flowers totally congested together, so it's hundreds and hundreds small male flowers. Probably it's either the tiny perianth part which are purplish, or maybe the stamens or both. Uh, it's possible. And uh, here we see also the young stage, uh, not yet developed. And here, so the fertile, totally mature stage. Aglaonema with a wavy, wavy leaves. It's a quite small species, and we see both the inflorescence and the ripe berries.
under this uh, vertical slope, we see uh, a ginger with undulate leaves. Oh, the beautiful inflorescence arising from the sheath of the basal leaves. So, is typical of the genus Plagiostachys. The bracts are already bright red, so maybe it will not become a big inflorescence. This is a Taka. I can say that due to the venation. Just quite thick leaves. Why it's not one of the species we can see in Peninsular Malaysia, for instance. There are not so many species, but in Borneo, there have been recently described some new species of Taka. Always so beautiful. Unfortunately, no inflorescence. Yeah. Wow, and these are huge trees. We can see strange structure. It's a huge basket of a Drinaria narrow pinule, so probably it's a Drinaria rigidula. And also, I see a totally green thing. Maybe it's a huge basket of Platycerium, but uh, this one is totally green. So it's a uh, Really impressive to see epiphytes so high, and also we can see that the Arase, the Raphidophora are climbing also very high, not only staying in forest understory, but climbing high, same as Piper. So all these species we see usually climbing up to five or six meters, we see they can climb up to 25, 30 meters inside the canopy. Grammatophyllum speciosum, the tallest, the longest, the biggest orchid of the world. And here is growing at about 35 meters above the soil on one of the big branches. This is the ficus villosa climbing, but I'm surprised because it's climbing so high and it has no lateral branches, it's still in the kind of juvenile stage, while it is now at about more than 20 meters above the soil. Il y a des fleurs rouges là. Oui. C'est des chinantus Je ne sais pas si c'est autre chose. Si, 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 c'est les fleurs des chinantus, je pense. Grinaria rigidula is creating a huge, huge basket and it is usually deciduous. It loses the fronts during the dry season according to the rhythm of each individual because in some parts we see only the brown fronts because of course there are the two kinds of fronts, the long vegetative fronts which are doing the photosynthesis and bearing the sori, the spores, and the basket front, which become very quickly erect and brown and collecting all the dead leaves from the canopy. So creating this huge humus basket. The brown fronds are green just a few weeks, but they can persist during many years as the retaining structure for the dead leaves on the water. Here another Drinaria, which has smaller green photosynthetic fronts, but a bigger, sterile, humus collecting, erect, brown fronts. Uh, 
uh, so it's uh, another Drenaria and uh, this one has bigger fronts very very rigid and uh, also I see a piper arising from the forest understory a climbing piper reaching the canopy so uh, I'm surprised to see in uh, this uh, canopy so many epiphytic plants because very often epiphytes are mostly close to the rivers or in mountain forests but here it means that the humidity level is very high in pouring. A small species of curculigo with uh, grey, silver grey leaves. Shiny silver grey. This uh, palm like uh, plant <laughs> or ginger like plant is not at all neither a ginger nor a palm. It is actually a grass, forest understory grass with very, very wide leaves and this is the genus Leptaspis. Few species but we can find it both in Africa and in Asia and something is very particular in this Leptaspis is that the leaf is upside down. I mean we see that the vine is totally preeminent on the surface of the leaf because actually the leaf would be like this when initiated. This is the superior, the upper surface of the leaf, but it turns to expose the under surface and we see clearly that it turns at the insertion on the stem. So why are they doing this? Always the leptas piece has the inverted leaf blade like this. Of course, it's, uh, it has an adaptive value, probably due to the distribution of the chloroplast in the leaves, usually of the grasses, of the poaceae, and in this case, in very shaded areas, maybe it's better to have inverted leaf blade to expose in the best way the chloroplast. A big clump of, uh, of costus here and we see all the erect huge stems which are branched at the top and we see at the base all of these so beautiful and numerous inflorescences so we see the bracts and the calyx lobes which are very very spiny and we see the flower emerging from each of these calyx lobes and the labellum of course is pure orange and the other petals are just around creating a kind of tube just around the labellum and we see also the huge huge swollen base of each stem maintaining firmly encored in the soil, these huge stems branched at the top. Huge arrasé, looks like uh, Xanthosoma, looks like uh, a little bit an alocasia. If uh, we were in American tropics, we could think also to a philodendron according to the vines. Uh, of course, here in Borneo, we think about alocasia when we see huge things like this, but actually vines are not at all characteristic of alocasia. Separation here also not at all characteristic. There is not a huge submarginal vine. And when I look at the inflorescence, I see that it is bending and cut just in the middle. And actually, this is the tallest, the biggest species of schismatoglottis. Usually schismatoglottis are plants about this size or this size or this size, but one species 
This one is Kismatoclotis corneri, of course dedicated to corner, who are specialists of mushrooms and uh, uh, also ficus and with a theory, famous Dorian theory. Anyway, it is endemic from this uh, northwestern part of uh, Sabah. And uh, so it's the first time I see a schismatoglottis with so huge leaves. And it is the only species like this in the world. <laughs>